With that said, we're going to be looking at chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, as we open up and introduce this particular chapter of the Gospel of John. And so I'll begin reading here, and uh, I'll start at verse 1. I'll read to verse 5, and we'll get into our study. John's Gospel, chapter 17, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. John writes, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glor glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, I want you to notice, even as we begin, I'm going to give to you a bit of an introduction. As a matter of fact, it's going to take a little while to do to develop this because you'll see why I'm doing that uh, by the time we get into our study because this is a, a chapter that deals with Jesus praying. And when you read the gospel, you, you immediately notice something. You notice that Jesus prayed often. It, it was his habit. And it's something that the writers of the gospels mention fairly often. For example, in in Mark's gospel, in chapter 1, verse 35, Mark said, In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So in the gospel of Mark from the beginning, the first chapter, Mark makes a note that Jesus Christ prayed often, and he would arise early, it says here, before daylight. He would arise a long time before daylight, and he would go to a, a quiet, deserted place, a solitary place, and there he would pray. Now, sometimes people might wonder, why is it that Jesus Christ prayed? After all, since he's God in the flesh, would he not have already known what to do? Why would he pray? Why was it that Jesus would pray? Being God in the flesh, you would think that he'd already know what he's supposed to do. But we find many times, and I'm going to show you many instances of this, Jesus would pray. Well, someone said Jesus' praying to the Father was a demonstration of his relationship within the Trinity and an example for us that we must rely on God through prayer for the strength and wisdom that we need. Since Christ, as the God-man, needed to have a vibrant prayer life, so should the follower of Christ today. You see, Jesus had said that he had come to do his Father's will. When we were in chapter 4 of the Gospel of John, verse 34, uh, John wrote, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So in prayer, he would speak with his Father and would be directed. And that was his purpose in coming to earth, is that he might know his Father's will and do it. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 7, it reads, I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. So when you read the Gospels, you'll see that his prayer life is mentioned often. We've seen this as we've gone through the Gospel of John. Let me remind you of a few things in a moment. But you see that he would pray quite often. Remember that before the raising of Lazarus, as is recorded in John chapter 11, verses 41 and 42, Jesus prayed. It says they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. So John gives us an example in chapter 11 of his prayer life. In John 12, verse 28, once again, he, he gives us another example. Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I have both glor glorified it and I will glorify it again. In, in Jesus' prayer life is mentioned from the beginning 
It was there at, at his baptism in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. He prayed before he chose the twelve. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. It came to pass in those days that he went out to a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And, and from them, he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. It's recorded in Mark chapter 6, verse 46, that he prayed after feeding the 5,000. It says, when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. He prayed before he had asked his men uh, that who, who, who it was that they said that he is. Uh, he, prayed, uh, he prayed, and it's, it's mentioned in Luke chapter 9, verse 18. It says, it happened as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? He prayed at the transfiguration, as is recorded in Luke 9, 29. It says, He prayed, and the appearance of his face was altered. His robe became white and glistening. On the night he was betrayed, he told Peter that he had prayed for him, Luke 22, 31, and 32. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. You see, over and over and over again, incidents where Jesus prayed. The Gospels record that he prayed three times while in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was on the cross, three prayers are recorded. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. In addition to this, Jesus gave thanks before the feeding of the 5,000, as mentioned, and again before the feeding of the 4,000. He also prayed a word of thanks at the Last Supper and at the Supper at Emmaus. So you see that Jesus' life was filled with prayer. A writer by the name of R.A. Torrey said, Jesus prayed early in the morning as well as all night. He prayed both before and after the great events of his life, and he prayed when life was unusually busy. There was something about his prayer life that causes men to take note. It's interesting. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, It came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. It's interesting that nowhere in the Gospels do you ever see one of his men approach him and say to him, Lord, teach us to preach. Nowhere does it say, Lord, teach us to perform miracles. Teach us to counsel. Teach us to... You don't see them asking for him to teach them to do anything, any, any other thing except for prayer. And that to me is, is very interesting and very fascinating because that was one of the things, if not the thing, that stood out the most in the minds of the apostles. Teach us how to pray. We have noted that you get up early, go to solitary places, and you pray. We've noticed that no matter what it is that you're doing, whether you're busy or whether you're not that busy, you take time to pray. We note that you have a knowledge of the will of your Father, and we know that it comes through your communion with Him. So if you can teach us anything, would you please teach us how to pray. On earth he prayed, and he continues doing so for us now. Hebrews 7.25 says, He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is praying for us even as I speak. He prays for us because he ever lives to make intercession for us. When you look at the life of Christ, you see that he prayed, and, and you see that he, he spoke of prayer. The most obvious prayer that Jesus prayed would be the one that he was teaching us how to pray, and that would have been what we call the Our Father. And there he gave an example of how to pray. Well, here in John chapter 17, he gives us a teaching related to it, and he's praying now for what is called his consecration. And he's praying for his own consecration. He's praying for the consecration or the setting apart of his apostles and he's also, and we'll see this as we go through this, he's also praying for future believers. He's praying for us. So chapter 17, as we look at John 17, contains a prayer that Jesus addresses to his Father. This particular prayer is divided into three sections. Verses 1 through 5, 
which we're going to look at tonight. Then verses 6 through 19, where Jesus, Jesus prays for the apostles. And then verses 20 through 26, where he prays for future believers, where he prays for us. And so we're going to be looking tonight at verses 1 through 5. It's going to be his prayer of consecration because he's about to complete his task. And so that's what we're looking at. Let's begin by looking at verse 1. John writes, Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Jesus has been teaching his disciples. As we've been going through the Gospel of John, we know that he has exhaustively taught his disciples throughout this evening. When we begin to look at the things that he taught his disciples from chapter 13 to where we are now, he spoke to them concerning serving the Lord. He spoke to them concerning his departure to the Father. He spoke of their denial that they would, they, that they would have concerning him. He, he taught them concerning his preparation of a place for them, of being the exclusive way to God. He spoke of the coming of the Comforter, taught them to abide in him, to love one another. He told them that the world was going to hate them, that persecution was going to occur. He spoke of his death. He spoke of his resurrection. He taught them to pray in his name. And he closed by telling them that the Father himself loves them. And as he's been teaching all of these very powerful things, he now closes with prayer. And so this prayer reveals his looking to the cross where he's, he's going to complete his mission. Notice how he begins in verse 1. He begins, Father, the hour has come. Now, Jesus has spoken of this hour often as he was preparing his disciples. The hour speaks of his time of suffering. It speaks of his death upon the cross. And he would use this term hour, this hour, often as he taught. Remember in John 2, we saw this in John 2, verse 4, where he spoke to his mother, and he said, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He used that term in John chapter 7, verse 30, where it says no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. In John 8, 20, no one laid hands on him. His hour had not yet come. In John 12, 27, now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. And then John 13, verse 1, Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Well, now the hour has arrived. The hour is upon him, and what does he do? He prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Glorify your Son. You know, it's interesting to me, and I'll say this very briefly. This isn't in my notes, but it comes to mind as I'm speaking to you right now. You can do a lot of things before you pray, but you can't do very much until you pray. And there are quite a number of people, a lot of voices today, who are saying, your prayers are worthless, your prayers are useless. Why are you praying? You need to do something. We're hearing that right now. Why are you praying? You need to be busy. You need to do something. Well, you know what? I can go out and do something, but I'm not always successful. Or I can speak to the one who's always successful and ask him to be of help. It isn't a cop-out to pray. It's the wisest thing I can do. All you have to do is realize that you're puny, you're weak, you're useless, you're unable. All I had to do is do that. And because I am those things, I need someone who isn't weak. I need someone who is able. The wisest thing I can do is call upon him. And we're told in Scripture to do so. Call upon me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Jesus says we're to pray. Pray at all times. We're told by Paul, pray without ceasing. What we do is we speak to the Lord, not to get him on our side, so that we might be on his side. We pray to the Lord not so that we can give him advice and direction, so, but in order that he might give us direction by his spirit. And it isn't a cop-out for me to get on my knees as I've been doing, as you have been doing, and pray for this nation. And to say, God, help us, awaken us. Lord, work, use the church. 
Help me to know what to do. There are so many voices that are screaming and crying out right now that it's hard to hear your voice above the wind. So I need a quiet place. I need a place where you can speak to my heart because, Lord, I don't have the answer for what's going on, not the practical solution. And there's so many who are crying out saying, do this and do that, do this, go here, do that. And for me, Lord, I just want to learn to just wait on you. I just want to know what you want me to do because when I sense your leading and I do what you say to do, then you're going to show up because I can't force you to show up. I simply want you to move and I want to be in the center of your will as you do. If Jesus Christ himself prayed, why don't we? If Jesus Christ himself sought his father, why don't we? The wisest thing I can do is learn to communicate to my father and to speak to him in prayer. And Jesus is doing just that. I gave you so many examples preceding this because Jesus prayed. He would awaken early, go to a solitary place. He'd seek his father. He'd be ready. He'd go out. He'd do the will of his father. And he did it every day. So much so that his disciples saw this about him and said, teach us to pray. Because we see the secret of how you know to do what you're doing. It's your prayer life. Teach us to pray. So the church needs to do the same. We need to say, God, teach us to pray. And that's what he's doing. Father, the hour's come. It's time for me to be glorified so that I might glorify you. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. That word glorify speaks of honoring or magnifying. The word glorify means to cause worth of a person or thing to be known. Uh, what was the vehicle of this glory for Jesus Christ? The vehicle of glory is the cross because it's a cross that causes us to give praise and glory to him. In Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, the prophet said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Remember in John 12, 23, how Jesus said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified? Well, it's time for him to give up his life. So how is he going to bring glory to his Father? While well, he's submitted fully to his will. Again, in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I've been sent on a mission, and my satisfaction is derived from completing it. Notice in verse 2, as he says, uh, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. By obedience unto death, Jesus has authority over all flesh. And he, notice, he gives eternal life. Here's something very simple that I'm going to say, but it's something that gets Christians into arguments with people. But here's, here's what the Bible teaches. Without Jesus, no man can be saved. That's what the Bible teaches. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so Jesus Christ is the one who saves us, and it's coming to the Father through him, as he earlier said. But notice how he says that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Eternal life. Eternal life is not something that is earned. It's not something purchased. It's not something bargained for. And it's not something that's inherited. The idea of earning salvation is at the heart of all of man's religious efforts. In John 6, 28 and 29, uh, these people were speaking to him, and they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? In other words, what can we do to please God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Every, every religious system is built on doing the very best that you can do, trying as hard as you can. But Christianity is built on Jesus Christ doing what you can't do. Jesus gave the sacrifice of himself, the offering that was perfect. 
we can't give that offering. But if you look at every religion, think of any religion on the face of the earth, you're going to see the same thing in all of them, and that is self, uh, self salvation, working hard, doing the best you can in order that you might somehow earn God's pleasure. And that runs right in the face of God's grace. There's not a single thing I did, not a single thing I did, not a single thing that you can do to earn salvation. Not a thing. Not a thing. But when you go to church sometimes, it almost seems that so many sermons are telling us what we're supposed to be doing. Well, there's a lot of truth to the things that we'll read as we Look at the scripture and says, this is what I want of you. But if you don't start at the place of grace, you're not going to be anything but frustrated. When you discover that it's through God's grace that you were saved and that the Lord knows that you're flesh and he, he, he knows beforehand that we're all going to fail in one way or another. He already knows all of those things. And yet at the same time, he still, he still saved us. That tells me something about the grace of God. And so the Lord Jesus Christ yielded up his life for me so that I, a person who is, is unrighteous, might have a, a relationship with a righteous God. Well, when I understand that he has given to me eternal life as a free gift, then that is something that has changed my life. You see, eternal life, again, is, is a gift given freely by God's grace, and it's received through faith. It's something he gives. It's not something I'm entitled to. It's not something I deserve. It's not something that I've earned. It's by his grace. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so he says that, that God has given us grace and God has given to us eternal life and this is something that we have in his son now notice in verse 2 how it says you have given him as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him so salvation originates with God God draws people to faith in Christ because we have a picture through the gospel of his death on a cross and we saw in chapter 6, verse 44, that no one can come to him unless the Father who sent him draws that person. So he uses the message of the gospel to do this. And the message of the gospel is a declaration of what God has done. Salvation doesn't originate with stories. It doesn't originate with our feelings. It certainly doesn't originate in our opinions. Salvation originates in the gospel message declaring to us that Jesus Christ died on a cross. In John 12, 32, he said, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And so what do we do? We present Jesus Christ crucified. We declare to people why he did that and encourage people to have a relationship. And as a result of that, we have eternal life. Now notice verse three, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life. So, again, I just felt like look, looking up a lot of Scripture because the words eternal life are used frequently in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of John and, and the writings of John. So just remembering a few of the passages in the Gospel of John, speaking of eternal life, John 3, 15 and 16, Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. John 6, verse 40, this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. John 10, 28, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And then one example out of 1 John 5, 11, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So let's look at that for just a moment, eternal life. Eternal life isn't measured in seconds or minutes. It's not 
measured in hours, days, weeks, months, or years. Eternal life isn't specifically speaking of a length of days in terms of just living long. Eternal life is actually defined here in verse 3 as fellowship with God. Notice what he said, verse 3. This, he said, is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. It is called age-abiding life, and eternal life is not speaking simply of time, it's speaking of quality. It's speaking of a quality of life that comes through a relationship with the Father. It speaks of a relationship with God that produces a life that is filled with the presence of the Lord. And this is eternal life, to know God. And when you have a relationship with God, it's not just that it extends in, into infinity, it, it's, it's speaking of a quality of relationship that you have because of him. And this is something, guys, let me think about this and speak about this for a moment, that I think a lot of Christians have failed to realize. And hopefully today, as we're looking at this, I can share with you a few things that will help us to get our eyes on where they're supposed to be. If, if all we look at is what we have and what we're going through right now, I think, I think that sometimes we could say with Paul, of all men, we are most miserable. Because sometimes the things that we go through are just so hard and so difficult, so filled with disappointment and sorrow, so many times filled with affliction and so many times filled with, with things that would be normally considered negative, that when, when, when you, you start thinking about how your life is going at that moment, you could very easily say, what a waste my life has been. I, I'm sad all the time. I'm, I'm frustrated all the time. It seems like I never get ahead. It seems like I take two steps forward and then three steps back. I don't know what's going on. And there are a lot of Christians like that. And you know what? I understand that because I've been there. But one of the things over time that has helped me is to come to realize, and I've been saying this a lot lately because especially in the face of all that we're going through as a nation right now, from coronavirus to, to rioting and all of that, it's, if it's not one thing that's discouraging, it's another. If it's not one thing, it's another. And it's almost like, you know, when you go to the beach, if you go to the beach at all, if, if you go to the beach, I used to go to the beach all the time when I was a kid. I don't go anymore because they usually try to harpoon me. But when I was a kid, I used to go to the beach a lot. And when I go to the, the beach, I, I, I used to do a lot of body surfing. And some of, some of you know body surfing and, and all of that. You know, you wait for the wave, you take off on it, the wave starts to build, you take off at the right time, and you ride the wave, it's a blast, it's a lot of fun. I loved body surfing, but there were times when I would go out and the wave would suck me in. And when it sucked me in, it would throw me to the ground, you know, to the sand and bounce me around for a while. And then you start thinking within yourself, am I ever going to get out of this? And all of that. So what at one time was a pleasure became something that you could even be frightened. I still remember on one occasion, I went out and, and I was starting to, to, to catch waves and all. And, and uh, it was a little big that day. And and before you know it, I was out further than I wanted to be, and I'm not a good swimmer. And so I'm thinking, oh, boy. So I got a cramp. And I remember laying, uh, rolling over on my back and starting to try and just backstroke to come, come in. And, and I was out there. I was a distance out. I was in, it felt like miles. It probably was 20 feet, but it felt like miles. I was out there, and I'm, it wasn't that far, but it was far. And I was trying to come in. I still remember... And I was like 16, 15 years old. And I still remember that I couldn't move my arms anymore. I was that tired because the waves and everything was drawing me back and I was fighting. It was just, and I'm not a good swimmer. I remember just at one point I said, I, I can't do this anymore. And I actually just stopped and just let myself go down. And you know the funny thing is, when I let myself go down, I laid on the, on the sand I mean, I, I made it in. I just didn't know that. I've been, and, and I'm just laying there with my, <laughs> there's like an inch of water in my head. Even the things that sometimes give you pleasure can also end up 
causing you sorrows. And sometimes in our lives, we, um, we start looking around, we start thinking, you know, I gave my heart to Christ, and it doesn't seem like things are going the way that I thought they would. So f- fairly early in my Christian life up to this point now, and I think I, I think I can identify, and some of you can identify with this too, um, I came to realize that God, nowhere have I ever found him promising me that every day is going to be the best day of my life. I, I haven't found any scriptures that says I'm exempt from pain, sorrow, or disappointment. I haven't found any, have you? I haven't. I've read through the Bible more than once. I've taught it more than, I've taught through the whole Bible. I haven't found that, have you? Where it says, you, oh, come to Christ, and man, for the rest of your life, you will smile. You're going to wake up with a smile. You're going to go to sleep with a smile. I don't think so. You know, I've found out that life continues. But I also found out that I'm never alone. I've also found out that he never leaves me nor forsakes me. I have also found out that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've also found out that I can learn to love the unlovely. I myself have been many times and continue to be so to others, but I can learn to love those that are unlovely. I've also discovered that in him, I can forgive those who have despitefully used me. I've learned certain things through afflictions and pains and disappointments. But the number one thing I've learned is that eternal life is not length of days, it's relationship with the Father. And when I came to realize that, and I've grown to realize that, that I've been able to say, he never leaves me nor forsakes me. I never walk through the valley of the shadow of death alone. He is always with me. His rod and his staff, they really do comfort me. I have come to learn that those things are true. And the things that I've prayed that God would produce in my life, I've also discovered have come through the disappointments and afflictions and discouragements that I've I've encountered because in all of those dark times, and and by the way, there have been many of them, in all of those dark times, I have discovered that no matter how dark it's been and no matter how low I've gone, it always there's always a light at the end and there's always a hand lifting me up. I've discovered that because I have eternal life because it is to know the Father. That's the key. I'm never alone, and neither are you. God is with us. And Jesus is saying, this is eternal life, that they may know you, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship with the Father through Jesus. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the binding man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, saith the Lord. So it's not simply knowledge of a God or any God. It's knowledge of the true God. You see, there is only one true God. Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am the Lord. There is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. The only way to know the true God is to know the Son who came to reveal him. And Jesus is the one sent by the Father to bring people to fellowship with him. So notice verse 4, how he says, I've glorified you on the earth. I finished the work which you have given me to do. In other words, I have been perfectly obedient to your will. In John 8, 29, he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. I always do those things that please him. John 8, 46, which of you convicts me of sin if I tell the truth? Why do you not believe me? Jesus was perfectly obedient to the Father's will. He had not failed to be completely obedient. But now he has one more task. But notice how he speaks of this as an accomplished fact, even though it's still future. He was fully committed to it. And he completed his task by simultaneously bringing glory to God. His words and his works, his miracles, have revealed the glory of God on earth to men. And Jesus is the premier example 
of one who finishes well. And that's what every believer should be encouraged by. If there's anything I can encourage you with by way of application, it would be this. I have some people in here who are older. This may apply to you more you know, in, in a more personal way than for someone who's young right now, somebody who's young. Every day that you live with Jesus on the face of the earth is one day closer to being with him. One of the things that the Lord has reminded me of recently is that every day that I have with him is one less day on earth and one day closer to being there with him. So one of these days, and it really won't be that long from now compared to the length of years I've lived, one of these days, and it won't be that far from now, there will be, there will be a statement made, David Rosales is dead. That's not true, because I'll be like my pastor taught me and like others have said, I'll be more alive at that moment than I've ever been. To close your eyes here is simply to see him face to face. You know, eternal life is a relationship with God that continues in existence through fellowship as well as length of days. But you know what? I just want to finish well. I just want to finish well. When you're younger, you think, oh, I've got plenty of time. You know, I can start doing the things I, I, I know I should do, but I can do that later on. A lot of people are putting off their, their, their walks with the Lord. Uh, they're putting off some of the things that the Lord has, has said, I want to bless you, and if you do these things, they're putting them off for later on. But as you grow a bit older, you begin to realize that you have less opportunities in front of you than you've had behind you. And so you want to take more advantage of those days. You want to take more advantage of those opportunities. You want to make sure that you remain faithful because you want to be a blessing to others and, and you want God's hand of blessing on you. That's just a fact. And so for me, one of the things in my life is now I'm beginning to move into that phase of life where I want to finish well, that I want to finish well. And, and Jesus Christ obviously is speaking of the fact that he did and I believe that the Apostle Paul, using the example of Christ, also wanted to have a complete faithfulness, that he wanted to finish well. So it's interesting how when you look at Paul's statements uh, about this, you see it, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, you see this heart that Paul had that I'm sure he was inspired by Christ. This, this heart was inspired by Christ, where he had said in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. I have fought, I have finished, and I've been faithful. I've, I have fought, I've been a good soldier, I've been victorious in Christ. I have finished, I ran the course, set out for me successfully. Not only did I start, but I followed the rules, I ran well, and I completed that course. And I've been faithful, I've kept. I've guarded God's word. I've remained faithful to him. And I didn't compromise. I didn't water down his word. I lived for him. And that's something that I want to be able to say, that I did these things too. So I take inspiration from Jesus when he says in verse 4, I've glorified you on the earth. I've finished the work which you have given me to do. Now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had. This glory was one that he had with the Father because in essence he is one with God. And he's stating that he's divine. He's saying that he's co-eternal with the Father. Uh, one of my commentators, a man by the name of, of Barnes, said he laid aside for a time the external aspect of honor and consented to become despised and to assume the form of a servant. He now prays that God would raise him up to the dignity and honor which he had before his incarnation. You see, at the cross, God will be glorified through the Son. And after his death, he will once again resume the glory he had before the incarnation. And there's a scripture in Revelation, if you take notes, it's found in chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Where John says, I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches 
and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And so he says, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And then you see in Revelation that he receives that glory. If there's anything the church needs to learn to do now, and I'll close with this, is we need to learn to worship the Lord. Listen, if, if worship is boring to you, and I don't think it is, that's why I can say it like this, Heaven isn't a place you want to go. It's not a place you'd like. Because heaven is filled with glorifying Jesus Christ. Heaven is a place where we're going to be able to see him face to face. Where, do you ever wonder what he looks like? Do you ever wonder what his voice sounds like? Do you ever wonder those things? I have. I have. What does he look like? What will he sound like? What will it be like to be next to him? What will it be like to worship him? To see him face to face and to sing praises to him? Because that's heaven. Thousands upon thousands saying, You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You know, when my mom went home to be with the Lord, I told a story, and I'll close with this. I told a story of how when I grew up, and I spoke at her memorial, I spoke of how when I grew up, my parents on occasion would have friends come over for a Saturday night, and we had a little home with little front rooms, but they would invite several friends, and they would play music. And uh, we had something called a stereo. It was also called a hi-fi. There's ancient terms a lot of you don't understand. And my dad would get these records and play them. They were called records. And he would play them on the turntable. He wouldn't scratch. He would just let it play. And then my mom and he and their friends would dance. My dad couldn't dance. My dad had, he used to say, two left feet. He, he, he couldn't dance. My mom, different story. My mom was quite a dancer when she was young. She used to dance in dance contests. She had a lot of rhythm. She loved a strong, heavy beat. Mama would dance. And I saw my mom dance all my life till she got ill. And uh, I can still remember as kids do, peeking into the front room to watch the old people partying. And I would see my mom dancing, and I would see my dad, left foot, right foot, one, two, three, four. He couldn't move, but my mom would dance around him. She would dance, literally, you know, those, that, that saying that you could dance rings around him? My mom really did that. My mom would dance around my dad. And my dad had this big smile on his face. He would just be smiling, one, two, left, right. And mom would be bouncing around. And my brother and I saw that. My sister saw that as we grew up. And, and so when I was sharing with the people on my mom's memorial, I shared how my mama used to love to dance, and she would dance with my father. And it hit me. I said, you know, who knows? I don't want to teach this as doctrine. And certainly not, but I said, who knows? What if they are before the throne of God worshiping him together? And what if it's okay to move to the music before the Lord, to move and worship him? David danced before the Lord with all of his might. Is it possible that I one day may have rhythm too? <laughs> and to be able to just be up there and worshiping the Lord? And, and I began to think of what it would be like to be before the throne of God. To worship, And I said, you know, in that place, my dad's got rhythm. My dad and my mom together could worship the Lord together. Well, guess what, guys? You know, that may be just a sentimental story, and certainly it is. But there are some things involved in it that mean a lot to me, and that means one of these days, whatever it may be, whenever it, it's not too far from now, it's sooner now than, than ever before, 
we will see him face to face. We will worship him full throat, loud volume, praise. It'll be a beautiful time of worship. And so Jesus said, oh, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. And these men, and you and I too, will be able to see that one day. The worship that is due to the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. And our voices will be raised with joy and with praise and with thankfulness for what he did for us. And so Jesus is simply praying, and it's a beautiful thought, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And one day we will see that glory. We will see Jesus glorified because we will be amongst those who are bringing him glory. And so one of these days, and it won't be long from now, we will do that. Are you ready? I sure hope you are. I sure hope you are.